Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome again to our Facebook Live on Nursing Prioritization and Delegation, everybody. And I am so excited to be here with you again tonight. It's Thursday and we're doing our questions again and then of course our rationalization. So welcome to our session everyone. Uh, before anything else, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mr. Alan Matus. And I am a nurse educator. I have been teaching for almost uh, 25 years. I'm an NCLEX specialist. I teach students on how to pass the NCLEX. And also, I uh, am a nursing faculty in a nursing program. So I also teach students. And at the same time, I'm the founder of Matus Nursing Review and Matus Nursing Review Online NCLEX Academy. And also, um, if you do not know, I also have a book that I published in Amazon, so I'm an author, so I have the book there. It's uh, the title is Simple, Fast, and Easy NCLEX Review Book, and it's a book that's easy to read, and uh, a lot of students like it. So if you want to get a copy, then you can get it from Amazon, and also um, if you want to get a copy in the Philippines, it's uh, you can email Matus Nursing Review Academy at gmail.com, so you can get a uh, black and white copy of the book in the Philippines. Okay, all right. So hopefully everybody can hear me and I would like to welcome some people tonight, all right? So for tonight, I would like to welcome some people, okay? Who are the people here tonight? So let's see, okay, all right. So let's see who can hear me tonight. So we have uh, Carlos, Kanyas. So just some of the people that, that you know, I, I will give a shout out. So the, the latest one probably, so we have Gian and Michelle Mangahas, thank you for being here tonight. Also, Oni Alfonso and Erlene Casimir Louis. Um, Marie Altidor Pieri is also watching. MJ Enriquez. Um, some people that I haven't seen before, or you know the names. Lo Quarting is here. Uh, Memi Lawal, thank you very much for your shout out and. Uh, uh, of course, I'm very excited tonight, you know, and then for you to say that you're more excited, it's good. Okay, so thank you very much for that, guys. And also, Kaylis Johnson, Charmaine McGill, Lorraine Green, uh, Jerry McIntosh, uh, Rodolfo Jam, thank you for being here tonight. And of course, the first few people who came in, let's give them the first person who came in. Okay, so let's give them a shout out to first few people. So the very first one was Memi Lawal. So I'm giving you a very good shout out because you're the first one who logged in. Gadiato Trawali, okay? And then third, um, people are watching, that would be Julie Nerisa Rancapero, okay? And then Albert Thompson, who is our student in the online NCLEX Academy. So if you log on early again, and I'll give you a shout out everyone, okay? So our agenda for tonight, the first thing is, I'm gonna show you a testimonial, everyone. Okay, so uh, in this testimonial, this was shared to us by one of my students. Um, she actually is reviewing again for the uh, NCLEX. She already passed the uh, LPN and now she's taking the RN program or the RN exam. So she wrote in her testimonial, next is to prepare for the NCLEX. To those who is preparing for NCLEX, I just want to share that I'm using UWorld and enrolled with Matus Nursing Review, Matus Nursing Review and Plex Practice Test and Support Group. I enrolled with them three years ago for my LVN. Sir Alan Matus is very knowledgeable and helpful. The review class is really great. And I love the workbook because it is simplified, on point and very engaging while doing the review. I am nervous, but I'm also excited to prepare for the NCLEX, but for RN, this time. So thank you, Lord. So thank you very much to our student uh, for giving us this very nice testimonial. Okay. All right. So next, what do we have? I would just like to make a quick announcement of our upcoming schedule on January 30 to April 3, 2021. We are again uh, having our 10 day live comprehensive NCLEX review webinar. And um, that's a comprehensive webinar, especially for students who uh, graduated many years ago and they want to uh, refresh their content, you know, their nursing concepts. So especially if you feel like you're missing the content, this is the review program for you. So it's uh, 
a simple, fast, and easy NCLEX review, but then we're focusing only on the uh, most important topics and, of course, a comprehensive review program for the NCLEX, okay? So next we have, of course, for tonight, I guess, okay, <laughs> everybody is so excited for the free 90-day online access NCLEX review. So the last time uh, we, uh, I, we took a video and we posted in uh, Facebook, you know, the winner. So for tonight also, if you make comments and at the same time, uh, if you make, uh, uh, if you join the session tonight, then um, we will put you in a raffle and then immediately after the program, we will post the winner. So watch out because if you join, then maybe you can get the free 90 day online access and class review. And we have been doing this every week because this is just really our way of helping our nurses, especially that we have the pandemic and, uh, you know, economically, we are all uh, challenged. So that's the reason why we're trying to help a couple of our nurses through this, uh, through this uh, raffle, everyone. Okay. So to do their NCLEX review. Okay. So let's proceed to the next one. All right. So please, everybody, don't forget to share or subscribe if you're watching in YouTube. And that would really help a lot your classmates also or your friends who are taking the NCLEX examination. So please, um, that would be uh, very beneficial not only to you guys attending tonight, but also to the others who are attending or attending because you invited them. Okay. All right. Are you ready for our first question for tonight? Our first question for tonight is very challenging. Okay. So you better get ready with your calculators. Okay. Because we're going to have dosage calculation, which is the first question for tonight. Okay. So some comments that we have here in the comment section. So let's just go over. Good morning. So we have new people who came in. So we have Doctor, okay, and then also we have um, Miel Sovage, okay, Macon Econ Boncolmo, okay, and Abarcama Aurora also. Hi, David Mandela, Rigel Mansa. Thank you very much for being here tonight. You just came in, and we haven't really started actually yet. So everybody, I would like to ask, do you have your calculators, everyone? Okay, because our first question requires the use of calculator. So, yes. So our first question is a very challenging question. Uh, this is usually the, the dosage calculation question that a lot of our students have uh, um, a phobia, you know, um, usually in the NCLEX. Um, it's the calculation of dosage based on weight. And usually we do this for pediatric uh, patients or clients. So when you see these kinds of questions, I want you to be able to uh, answer them with confidence after the session. Uh, I'm giving you the most basic question on dosage calculation using weight, okay? The weight of the child. So some medications, especially for pediatrics, it's very important that we um, calculate the dosages based on the weight because we all know that not all children have the same weight they could be of the same age but they have different weights so it's very important that we uh, calculate the dosages based on their weight to prevent toxicity okay all right so um we will have the first question everyone so get ready okay so first question for tonight So our first question for tonight is, this is the first, uh, we only have one dosis calculation question for tonight, everyone, okay? But moving forward, maybe we will have one or two, okay? So number one question, a 44 pound child with heart failure is to receive the Joxin or Lanoxin. The dosage is 0.15 milligrams per kilograms per day to be given twice daily. On hand is lanoxine, uh, lanoxine elixir, which is 0.5 milligrams per ml. So how many ml should the nurse give? Okay, is it A, 0.5, B, 1.5, C, 3, or letter D, 6? You have to remember that in the NCLEX, you may not be given options like A, B, C, or D. In the NCLEX, what may happen is that um, you have to really put the number and you will be given instructions on how to round off your final answer. It could be rounding off to the nearest hundreds, the nearest tens, or the nearest uh, whole number also. So, 
in this question okay so again this is a 44 pound child with a heart failure is to receive the joxin or lanaxin the dosage is 0.15 milligrams per kilograms per day to be given twice daily on hand is lanaxin elixir which is 0.5 milligrams per ml how many ml should the nurse give that's a question Is it A, 0.5, B, 1.5, C, 3, or D, 6? Okay, so most of you are giving your answers. Very good. Now, what you can see there in the question, everyone, is that there is a drug label. So you can see lanoxine elixir, which is 0.5 milligrams per ml. And the total volume of the container or the bottle is 30 ml. And for every ml, there's 0.5 milligrams. So what you need to, to do here is to identify, you know, identify the dosage that you have to give to the child. And then after that, you have to calculate how many ml are you going to give in order to provide the correct dosage for the child, okay? So I think most of you were very quick with your answers. That is excellent. Okay, very good, everybody. You understand the situation. Okay. So, all right. The answer to this question, everyone, is going to be letter. Okay, so that will be letter C. It's going to be 3 ml. Very good. So in this situation, everyone, the order of the doctor is 0.15 milligrams per kilograms per day to be, give, be given twice daily. So the first step is you need to convert the pounds into kilograms. And how do you do that? Very important in the NCOX. 44 divided by 2.2 is equals to 20 kilograms. And then you have to calculate the daily dosage. The daily dosage now is 0.15 times 20. So meaning that uh, that's three milligrams per day. That's gonna be good for the whole day, three milligrams per day, because the doctor ordered per day, it's not per dose, okay? If the doctor did not indicate per day, then maybe it's directly a per dose. But in the situation, the 0.15 milligrams times 20 is equals to three milligrams per, per day is, is uh, the three milligrams there is a per day or a daily dose. And then you have to divide that by two, okay? Why do you have to divide by two? Because the uh, medication is to be given twice daily, to be given twice daily, okay? So uh, three milligrams divided by two is equal to 1.5 milligrams per dose. And now it means to say that you have to give 1.5 milligrams per dose, okay? Twice a day, all right? So, <clears throat> so, in this situation, in this situation, you divide 1.5 milligrams, okay, divided by 0.5 times 1 ml is equals to 3 ml. So that would be the answer every one. So per dose, you have to give 3 ml every body, okay? So very good, everybody. You got the right answer for that. The correct answer is going to be letter C in this question. So congratulations, everyone. Okay. So how many of you guys got the correct answer in this question? The answer is going to be 3 ml. So congratulations. Okay. So I think most of you got the correct answer correctly. Congratulations. Very good. Okay. All right. So now are you ready? Okay, for our prioritization question, everyone. So we're gonna have your prioritization question. Get ready, everybody. Okay, all right. So let's have the first prioritization question. So the question is, the registered nurse receives assignments for the shift. Which client should receive priority care? A the 44-year-old client was a temperature of 101.2 degrees Fahrenheit and WBC of 13,000. Letter B, the 24-year-old client who needs to receive the next dose of hydrocodone. C, the 52-year-old client with pernicious anemia complaining of dizziness and fatigue. Or letter D, 
the 35-year-old client with rheumatoid arthritis who reported joint stiffness in the morning. Okay, so I'll read the question again. The nurse receives assignments for the shift. Which client should receive priority care? A, the 44-year-old client was a temperature of 101.2 degrees Fahrenheit and WBC of 13,000. B, the 24-year-old client who needs to receive the next dose of hydrocodone. C, the 52-year-old client with pernicious anemia complaining of dizziness and fatigue, or letter D, the 35-year-old client with rheumatoid arthritis who reported joint stiffness in the morning. Okay, so who do you think comes first, in, uh, comes first in this situation? You have to look for the unstable patient, everyone. The most unstable, okay? And then you can also put your rational, everybody, why you chose a particular answer, okay? All right, A, B, C, or D. Who really comes first in this situation, okay? I can see most of you are giving the error answers. And I would like you to uh, analyze every item, A, B, C, or D, analyze each, which patient, okay? Which patient should receive priority care immediately because it's dangerous, it's a safety issue? Which one? A, which patient here is going to be the first priority? Okay. All right. Which patient should receive first priority? Okay. All right, so the answer is going to be, all right, so the answer is going to be, all right, so some people are still giving their answers, okay, some people are still giving their answers. So you have this patient, so which one immediately needs an intervention because the patient is having a serious condition, okay? All right, so you all have your answers. Okay, so be very careful with your answer in this question, everyone. I can see that you have all been analyzing carefully. So it seems that this question is a little bit challenging because we have different answers for everyone, okay, or from everyone. So the best answer, some of you are changing answers now after seeing the question again. The answer to this question, everyone, is going to be letter, okay? Everybody, I know you're also excited, okay? All right, the answer is going to be letter A, all right? A is the answer, why? Because A, temperature is 101.2. So you have fever going on in that patient and then you have WBC of 30. 13,000. What is the normal WBC? That would be 5,000 to 10,000. Okay, 5,000 to 10,000. So this patient is already having an infection. So you need to go to this patient immediately and intervene. Your letter B, of course, is not the answer because it's a pain, pain issue, your hydrocodone. Okay, uh, let us see. Pernicious anemia, it's anemia. So when you have pernicious anemia, these patients will, of course, complain of dizziness and fatigue, okay? And there is no indication the patient is unstable, okay? So dizziness is manifestation. I know you're all thinking of falling, okay, or oxygenation, but this patient is diagnosed with pernicious anemia. Um, compared to infection, which one is more serious at this time, right? Unless this patient with pernicious anemia has a very low hemoglobin level, then maybe that is the priority, okay? Or if the patient is having difficulty breathing, then airway comes first, right? But C has no airway problem. Now letter D, um, joint stiffness. Um, you have to remember that 
in rheumatoid arthritis, the most common manifestation is having joint stiffness in the morning or early morning stiffness. Okay? So, the answer for this question, everyone, is going to be... Okay, again, everybody, the answer is going to be letter A. Always remember, infection is such a big deal. Okay? Nowadays, we're even training nurses on how to really assess patients properly, especially for signs of sepsis, okay? So there's a big push in the hospital systems or in the healthcare industry. It's very important for nurses to be aware of the signs of sepsis and not just really the sepsis, but the early signs of infection, okay? Because if we do not uh, intervene immediately, you know, with patients having infection, then it might be too late. So that's why letter A is the answer. That's already infection happening, okay, 13,000. If the WBC is lower than 5,000, that is neutropenia, that means that that patient is prone to infection also, okay? So if letter C, if you have a patient there who's having shortness of breath, you know, pernicious anemia, then you have to take care of that patient first because airway is a priority or, or oxygenation. Okay, so the answer is going to be letter A, every one. Okay, so are you ready for the next question? So we have a lot of people writing their comments. Okay, so someone chose letter A, then changed to letter C. Okay, so very good. Okay, so letter C has no indication that, that the patient is unstable. Uh, you still have to address that. You still have to go to the patient, you know, um, you know, dizziness. Uh, pernicious anemia however a comes first we need immediately an order of antibiotic for that patient okay so don't forget that in the NCLEX everyone so let's go to the next question all right so next question all right so let's see number three the nurse receives the following clients after the end of shift report in performing rounds, which client should be assessed first? A, the 56-year-old client with stroke who is scheduled to be discharged after physical rehabilitation. B, the 38-year-old client who received an additional dose of furosemide due to increasing pulmonary crackles. C, the 24-year-old with leukemia who has a platelet count of 170,000 after a blood transfusion. Or D, the 56-year-old client who started receiving intravenous heparin to prevent deep vein thrombosis. So which patient here should be assessed first? That's the question. Who is the patient that needs to be assessed? Is it someone who is letter A scheduled to be discharged? Is it letter B, someone who received an additional dose of furosemide due to increasing pulmonary crackles? C, the 24-year-old client with leukemia who has a platelet count of 170,000 after a blood transfusion? Or letter D, the client who started receiving intravenous heparin to prevent deep vein thrombosis? So this patient was started on heparin. I would like you, everyone, to go back to the concept when we talk about assessment and your prioritization. Airway, breathing, circulation, oxygenation, always go back to that, everyone. So which patient here is probably unstable, okay? Unstable, who is in great danger, okay? Someone who needs to be assessed because you have four of these patients, you know, given to you at the start of your shift. So among these four patients, to which patient will you go immediately first to assess? Who will you assess first in this situation? Okay. So what do you think is the answer? All right. So what's the answer, everyone? Okay, so most of you, okay, some of you are giving different answers, okay, all right, who do you think is the patient who needs to be assessed first? 
So you have a nurse saying that this patient is scheduled for discharge, or you have the nurse also telling you that, oh, this patient received furosemide because this patient during my shift has been having increasing crackles in the when I'm doing auscultation. Or they see, oh, this patient's lab came back. The platelet count is 170,000, you know, after blood transfusion. Or letter D, oh, I started intravenous heparin, you know, the doctor ordered just to make sure that this patient does not develop deep vein thrombosis, okay? So the question is, should be assessed first, okay? Should be assessed first, all right? Okay, so the answer here, everyone, is going to be what? Okay, so some of you got the answers right, actually, okay? All right, so Makon Ikon Boncolmo, she said, I will change to letter B. Why did you change to letter B? <laughs> okay, so the answer to this question, everyone, it's going to be exciting. Always be guided, okay? So the answer here, everybody. Now, one reason probably that uh, you don't get the answer right away too is because, you know, we, we have to give your answer right away. But maybe, hopefully, after this, you will realize why, okay? So the answer is letter B, everyone, letter B. Why is it letter B? Always remember that in prioritization, and I teach this in my in-services, change in condition reporting, change in condition. Change in condition is such a big thing in healthcare because as nurses, we should be able to detect change of condition early so that we prevent complications. Am I right? So letter B is a change in condition that was reported in the prior shift who received additional dose of furosemide. So something wrong is going on with this patient. Okay. This patient is having increasing pulmonary crackles, meaning that there's pulmonary edema going on in this patient. So you want to go back and check that patient, check the lungs, if the medication is working or not. Because if not, this is an airway issue, an oxygenation issue. Am I right? So letter B, you want to find out if this patient is doing okay, especially the word increasing, increasing pulmonary crackles, okay? So meaning this patient situation is getting worse. We don't know. Is there pneumonia going on in this patient? Is there heart failure that's worsening, okay? All right. So that's why A is the, uh, B is the answer, okay? Now, your letter A is not the answer because usually, as what we have said before, uh, patients who are scheduled to be discharged are usually stable patients, okay? Your letter C, the fact that your platelet count is 170,000, that means that it's okay. That's within the normal range, okay? Because your platelet starts at 150,000 to 400,000, you know. Sometimes, you know, it differs the values, okay? Now, letter D. The patient is started on intravenous heparin to prevent. This patient does not have any deep vein thrombosis yet, but it's just for prevention. You're going to check that patient also. You want to find out how he see reacting to the heparin, but do you think the reaction is that immediate? You know, you want to check for someone who is having probably, um, who's having some respiratory issues, you know, respiratory again. So that's why the answer is going to be letter B, everyone. Okay. So... The, the rationale for letter B is not because this patient received Lasix and you have to check for the hypokalemia, you know, it may happen, you know, but the fact is letter B is a change in condition, okay? And change in condition patients are part of your end of shift report. When you have an end of shift reporting, the number one, okay, what are the items that you do in your end of shift report? What are the most important items? Admissions. Okay, change in condition, critical laboratory results. Those are the most important things that you want to cover in your end of shift report. Okay, so letter B is a change in condition and you really need to make your rounds. And those are the first patients you want to see. Okay, because there is a change in condition. So uh, remember this, write this down. Okay, a sign that your patient may be having a change in condition or is not doing well is uh, the acronym USA. So U means that when there's a change in condition, 
it's unrelieved by interventions. So in letter B, for example, if we give you rosemite and then you go back there and the crackles are still there, it's getting worse, it's unrelieved, then you have to report that, right? Because it's getting worse. Uh, U S A. So U is unrelieved by interventions. S would be a sudden change, a sudden change. Okay. And letter A, U S A. A would be a marked change, a marked change. So letter B is a marked change, you know, like increasing pulmonary crackles. So the word increasing. Okay. Or maybe we can use worsening pulmonary crackle so that patient is in danger so watch out for that everybody okay all right so the answer is going to be letter b in that situation okay so i hope that you're learning everyone because this is really very important especially end of shift report it comes out in the NCLEX how you properly do that so start thinking what are the most important items that you want to hand off during the end of shift report okay admissions change of condition critical laboratories any uh any urgent situations that happen within your shift you need to uh, hand off that or endorse to the next nurse and if you're the receiving nurse and you know that you have three patients who had a change in condition during the prior shift then you have to start thinking among these three patients whom should i check first okay making sure they're fine okay so hopefully you got the uh, idea on that question everyone okay so our last question, everybody. So thank you very much. So we have a comment from Abarkama Aurora. She said, yes, loving it, learning something new with each question. So thank you very much. So you better watch all of my videos then, okay? Because the, the point is, is not to memorize the answers. The point is to change the way you think. You know, that's the most important thing, changing the way you think, okay? All right. So let's proceed to the last question and delegation. I had a student who took the NCLEX recently, the LPN, and she said there's a lot of delegation questions, but I think most of you I've noticed are really doing very well in delegation, okay? So the delegation tonight is for the UAP because last week that was for the LPN, so for tonight UAP. So let's see if you can get the right answer, everyone. The registered nurse is giving assignments for the shift which task can be delegated to an unlicensed assistive personnel or uap select all that apply so this is a direct to the point question okay so is it a irrigating a colostomy b measuring intake and output c collecting urine specimen a stool specimen d documenting routine vital signs e measuring wound size or f providing a complete bed bath Okay, so let's repeat again. Um, the registered nurse is giving assignments for the shift. Which task can be delegated to an unlicensed assistive personnel or UAP select all that apply? A, irrigating a colostomy, B, measuring intake and output, C, collecting stool specimen, D, documenting routine vital signs, E, measuring wound size, or letter F, that would be providing a complete bed bath. Okay, I can see everyone answering. Um, I would like to remind everyone that again, for the UAP, it has to be stable patients. This is just a direct to the point question. You know, it's not telling us if the patient is stable or unstable because definitely if the patient is unstable, then we cannot, you know, we cannot delegate. The RN cannot delegate. So basically this is just a list of uh, what the uh, UAP can do. And always remember that uh, in other states, UAP may have different scopes of practice, you know. So what we have here are, ju are just the general scope of practice. So once it is within the scope of practice, it's okay. And now you have to find out if the patient is stable or unstable, right? Okay. So let's proceed, everyone. Okay, we'll have the answer now. I think most of you got the answers there. So let's see. Okay, so we'll find out the answer now, everyone, to that question. Okay, so the answer is going to be, okay, very good. That will be B, C, D, and F. I think most of you got the correct, the correct answer. Very good. All right, 
So you have irrigating a colostomy. Okay, so but before that, let's discuss the answer. B, measuring intake and output. Your measuring intake and output is part of the routine task that the UAP can do. Okay, uh, collecting stool specimen, the same thing. Um, documenting routine vital signs. UAPs can perform um, taking the routine vital signs, but then they also have to document. You know, they also document, but what they document is routine vital signs, or they can also document the amount of food that the patient uh, uh, ate, you know, like 50%, 60%. So they can document, but as long as it's within their scope of practice, right? Now your letter F providing a complete bed bath, definitely that would be for the, uh, for the uh, UAP. Now, is feeding a client within the scope of practice? Yes, feeding, but if the client has dysphagia, no. Uh, ambulating, yes, but if it's the first time the patient is ambulating after a major surgery, then maybe the RN should be the one doing that, right? So always remember if it's a first time, you may have to think twice before assigning that to the UAP. Again, always remember, if it's the patient's first time, uh, the RN should think twice before assigning to the UAP. Like for example, ambulating a client who recently had a major surgery, turning the patient who recently had the surgery. So uh, the RN should really use critical thinking, you know, that uh, the uh, UAP can do this, but then if the patient is unstable, then don't give it to the UAP, all right? So irrigating a colostomy is an invasive procedure. So that would be for the uh, RN, okay? Or the LPN can do that. Measuring wound size, that's for the licensed nurse also. So most of you uh, got the correct answer, everyone. I'm really very happy about that because I think I'm very confident that in the actual NCLEX exam, you'll be getting the correct answers when it comes to delegation. Next week, okay, we'll be discussing also questions about floating, okay? So what kind of responsibilities or tasks can the RN assign to someone who is floating into the unit? Because you do get those kinds of questions. And again, I'll be teaching you tips about that. But then the last time, remember, we, uh, we had questions about floating also, okay? So, all right, everybody. So before we end for tonight and announce the winner last time, okay, um, I would just like to plug in, okay, our, our program. So again, just really very quick, I've been setting out recently uh, my workbooks um, to India, to Florida, to Las Vegas, and thank you very much, everyone. And uh, our workbook is only ninety-four fifty, and then our monthly subscription is forty-nine dollars per month. If you need more information about our programs, just send us an email, and we will respond to you to give you more information. Okay, so the total of which is one forty-three dollars and fifty. So we have live webinars. We also have the self-study program. Okay. All right, and if you know someone who passed, let me know everybody. I just had one student, uh, I had one student uh, today, okay, who did the pop-up and she passed in the pop-up. So we will find out in the quick results, okay? So hopefully she finally passed her NCLEX PN as well. So our winner for last week, everyone, was Lady Diane Nico. So she's the one who won last week. So. If you want to wait after this Facebook Live, we're going to post the winner, everyone. Okay, so congratulations to Lady did last week for winning. Okay, and then let's look at some of the comments here. Thank you very much, everybody. Welcome. Okay, so see you next week also. Okay, thank you very much for really participating also tonight. So you can watch some of the videos that we have here also in YouTube, okay? And all of these videos that we have in the online academy are also, or in this uh, Facebook Live, are also in our online academy. So you can watch all of the videos, okay? So thank you very much, everybody, and have a safe, safe night, everyone. Uh, I'm really very happy to have you here. Thank you, everyone. So let's have a shout out from Alfred. See you next week. Thank you so much. Very good. So I'll see you guys next week. Thank you. All right.